Hello, my name is Layla Irvin. I am a Scottish Japanese American student of Core Studio, a two quarter interdisciplinary program exploring the themes of material, memory, and repair through theory and practice. Today, I'm honored to introduce an artist whose work in paintings and ceramics is beautiful and evocative, one who infuses her artwork with feminine power and intersectional struggles of being a multiracial woman in America. Hanako O'Leary is unafraid to examine herself as well as the world around her, utilizing the legends of Japan and a particular no theater stage mask in her body of work, hashtag millennial fail, to explore aspects of femininity in today's social media focused society. O'Leary's work is, on the whole, an intriguing dive into femininity and intersectionality of being born and raised in America with strong Japanese maternal figures in your life. In her bio on her website, she says, I am one in a long line of Japanese women who dare to defy tradition and forge their own path. I place no allegiance to any given medium or art form. However, I make art because I believe it is through my hands that the deepest secrets, oldest stories, and most potent magic of my ancestors are preserved. My hands hold stories my voice has yet to discover, and with them I'll make our power be known. She is exhibited in galleries such as Method, Edmonds Community College, King Street Station, and Gallery for Culture. Major awards include the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture City Artist Grant, Bernie Funk Fellowship, Robert B. McMillan Grant, Nettie Award Finalist, and Artist Trust Fellowship. She currently has an exhibition at the Fry Art Museum until January 28th. With all that said, please welcome Hannah O'Leary. Hey, thank you, Layla. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Hanako. Uh, I think I'm going to um, get right into it and share my work with you. Um, one second here. Let's see. So um, as Layla mentioned, I am currently uh, exhibiting my body of work um, Izanami at the Fry Art Museum. And um, I, I consider myself mostly a ceramic artist. Um, I have done paintings in the past and I'll probably paint again eventually, but right now I'm, I'm pretty much strictly a sculptor. Um, but yeah, so uh, in today's presentation, uh, I wanted to share with you all um, my kind of background and uh, conceptual origins of making this body of work. And so before I dive into that, I wanted to start by providing a quick history of my family as culture and heritage play a big role in my work. So um, as you may have been able to tell from my name, Hanako O'Leary, my mother is Japanese and my father is American. Like many of us born and raised in the US, I grew up in a multicultural household. While I attended school every day in the Chicago suburbs, once I came home, I would take off my shoes, speak Japanese, and eat with chopsticks. While my Japanese-ness is very present in my work, and I often credit my father simply as father from the Midwest, I do want to emphasize that I've been extremely lucky to have been raised by two parents who both value the multicultural identities of their children. They worked extremely hard to maintain the connection to our Japanese roots, even while living in the United States. So before I get into it, I want to start this presentation by taking a moment to thanking my parents, because um, without them, it would not be possible for me to make the art that I make today. So for the first 18 years of my life, I would spend the school year living in the States and then my summers in Japan. My mother would take my siblings and I back to live with extended family in her hometown, a small rural island called Osaki Kamijima, set in the Seto Inlet Sea of Japan. There, I got to spend three months of every year with my four aunts, um, and you can see them photoed here, uh, Clockwise from the top is Atsuko, Nobuko, Nagako, Masako. And then there's my mom in the bottom left-hand corner. Through cooking, cleaning, and visiting temples and shrines together, 
I got to understand their own ideas of feminine strength and integrity. So I set up this background and I say all this to explain why my artwork looks the way it does. I use a very strong Japanese aesthetic in my work to represent my experience as an American woman. This work is not a critique on Japanese culture, but a perspective of Western feminism by a Japanese American artist. So now that that has been communicated, um, fast forward to 2012, I uh, graduated with a bachelor's in, um, or a BFA in ceramics and sculpture, and I moved to Seattle from Illinois. Here, I learned about the Hanya mask while working as an intern at the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Washington. The Hanya mask is a very important symbol to me and something I use over and over again in my work. Traditionally used in no theater, the Hanya mask represents women who have become possessed with jealousy, rage, and or heartbreak. It is believed that they are so overcome with their emotions that their soul prematurely leaves their body and they are left to roam the earth hungry for revenge. In no theater, all actors on the stage wear masks. Depending on the lighting and gesture of the actor, the Hanya may appear angry, sad, or overcome with hysterical laughter. Within the many traditions of no mask making, it is believed that in order to carve the Hanya mask, the mask maker must be extremely wise because only those with the most life experience could truly understand the full range of female pain. When I first discovered this image, I was shocked to learn that it symbolized the face of a woman. I only knew the image from Western video games and tattoos worn by men. It was fascinating to me that in the long patrilineal lines of no theater, mask making and storytelling, a world completely created from the imagination of men, the most terrifying adversary to a male protagonist was an angry woman. After learning about this image, I began making art that spoke to my own experience as an East Asian American woman. As I work with her, I take the Hanya image back from the male dominated theater traditions that gave birth to her and our North American pop cultural appropriations of her. So the intention of my artwork has been to challenge myself and other women to exist outside this limited scope of what society has constructed as for us as acceptable versions of womanhood. Through my work, I speak to what it actually is like to be a Hanya or an angry woman. So fast forward again, a few years later in 2018, I began this series, Izanami. Izanami meaning she who invites is the Shinto goddess of creation and death. Shinto is Japan's state religion, but it is also used as an umbrella term to refer to the many local belief systems practiced by Japanese people before the introduction of Buddhism from China. Izanami's story is first documented in the Kojiki as part of the original history of Japan. Written in around the year 700, the Kojiki documents the ancestry of Japan's royalty leading back to the primordial gods Izanami and Izanagi. According to legend, in the beginning of time, the universe created Izanami and Izanagi. Translated to mean she who invites and he who invites. They were the divine personification of the feminine and masculine. In order to build a home for themselves, Izanami was in instructed Izanagi to take his jeweled scepter and stir the primordial goo of the cosmos. Izanagi followed Izanami's instructions and stirred. The primordial oceans frothed with bubbles. Out of the foam emerged the Japanese islands. Once the couple created a home, next they decided to create a family. In the traditional mortal way, Izanami and Izanagi came together to procreate. 
Together, they created many gods and goddesses. For a while, everything was new and thriving. Izanami was excited to create this new land full of life. Eventually, after many years, Izanami grew tired of looking after the plants and animals. She knew there was more to her than just existing on the surface with the birds and the flowers. She wanted to create something new, something that would add contrast and depth to this bright and youthful world. She decided to create a mountain bigger than any that has ever existed, one that would connect the sky with the core of the earth. When the day came to give birth to this new god, her body opened up and delivered dirt and stone in a brilliant burst of lava. As the new god of fire was born, Izanami's body burned up and her transformation into the goddess of death was initiated. Her soul was sent down into the underworld and she became the first living being to experience death. Meanwhile, Izanagi became the first being to experience loss. Stricken with grief, he looked for Izanami in the underworld. Deep down under the earth, he ventured his way into Yomi, the land of darkness, a place where life and death ends and a place where life ends and death begins. The land of Yomi was dark and warm. The walls were wet and smelled of salty decay. Into the darkness, he called for Izanami. Izanami, where are you? I don't, I don't like this whole death thing. I need you to come back and be with me. There's so much to do in the land of the living, and I really don't know how to do any of this without you. Izanami, are you there? Do you hear me? Very faintly, he heard a voice in the distance. Izanagi, is that you? How long has it been? How is everybody? Wow, it's, it's really nice that you popped in unannounced to say hi, but I can't go back right now. I've already eaten the food and become one with this land. I know all this growth and change is scary, but I'm really excited for this new realm that I'm building. I can't go back for a while. This is my new project. Death is my new journey now. Izanagi, being the divine masculine, could not accept no for an answer. Izanami, you can't possibly be serious. You're supposed to be mine forever. And this is really triggering me right now. I'm not leaving here without you. Izanami, being the divine feminine, was still learning how to maintain her boundaries. Okay, Izanagi, please don't get upset. Let, let me see what I can do. Um, you're not supposed to be here unannounced and you have the potential to cause a lot of harm, but I'm going to have to check in with the balance of the cosmos and maybe there are some room for compromise. While I look into it, it's really important that you sit still and wait for me. I'll be back as soon as I can, but in the meantime, please don't move or touch anything. And no matter what you do, do not turn on the lights. Izanagi sighed and rolled his eyes. <sighs> sure thing, babe, you do you. I'll be right here, but don't take too long. I'm hungry and I have like no service. And with that, Izanami went off to people play please her way out of this conflict. While Izanagi sat around waiting for his wife to deescalate his triggered nervous system. Eventually his phone died and he had nothing left to occupy his mind. He was, he was hungry. He thought to himself, this is ridiculous. Things should not take this long. Like I know Izanami thinks she knows what she's doing because well, this whole realm was her concept and she kind of built it, invented it and discovered this place in the to begin with. But her divine feminine temperament is not cut out for leadership or negotiation or time management. It's time for me to step in as the divine masculine and exercise my superior skills of making shit happen. So Izanagi stood up and removed a wooden comb from his hair. With a snap of his fingers, he set it on fire, 
holding it, it in front of him as a torch. Suddenly, the world around him was illuminated, and he could see that indeed he stood in the land of the dead. All around him was death, blood, flesh, and gore in a continuous cycle of change. As he moved the flame around, he saw next to him lay the body of Izanami. No longer was she his youthful lover, but a dead body, deep in the throes of decay. Her flesh saggy and wrinkled and pale. Within her corpse, he saw the seven gods of thunder eternally feeding off her womb. No longer in the mood to, quote, make shit happen, Izanagi slowly started to back away. As if to sense this sudden change in moods, Izanami's undead body slowly became reanimated. She sat up with the serpent still writhing within her and looked up at Izanagi. Izanagi, what have you done? I asked you not to turn on the lights. Izanagi answered as he continued to slowly back away. Oh, I'm so sorry, babe, but you were taking forever. But actually it's okay because um, I'm glad. It, it really gave me a lot of time to reflect and like, you know, do that inner work. And I realized you were right all along. We need to be on our own journey right now. You have your journey, queen of the undead and, and mother of those new snake things. Um, and I have mine as the glorious patriarch of the Japanese pantheon. We live in separate worlds. We need to spend some time apart and, and you know, focus on our own growth. I think this is a great time to initiate like a no contact phase, just, you know, maybe for a few centuries. Izanagi turned around and started running towards the exit. Izanami, seeing her lover for the coward that he really is, finally found the strength to demand some accountability. Izanagi, you have disrespected my memory and disrupted the peace of this land. I demand you stay here and put in the work to repair this mess. Izanami gathered her new underworld friends, known historically in texts only as, quote, the hell hags, and quickly began to catch up to Izanagi. But he had access to undisclosed privileges that allowed him to dodge their grasps and he was able to step out of the underworld with just enough time to roll a boulder over the exit, blocking her from him. Oh, he's an army, he lamented as he leaned on the boulder. I want you to know that it's not you, it's, it's me. And this was really fun while it lasted and I'll never forget you. It is you, Izanami replied firmly from the other side of the rock. You have no idea of the disrespect and harm you unleash on this land. You are free to go and live your life as you please, but I will too. And from this day forward, every day I will take 1,000 lives from this realm we created together to serve the new one that I am building. Izanagi, in a flustered rage, answered, Wow, Izanami, is that really how you want this to end? I'm sorry you're so upset, but maybe I wouldn't have to block you if you weren't so crazy and clingy. And you know what? Take as many souls as you need. I'm the eternal golden pretty boy, the god of life. I have all of creation on my side, and history will forever be written to support my perspective. With my endless resources, I'll create 1,500 souls every day, and the world will forever be ashamed of your unpleasantness, and ugliness and difficultness and eternally grateful for my gracious victory. After a long silence, Izanami finally replied, my people and I have built this sacred land and history within us that will live on for eternity. And while you refuse to understand or respect it, it terrifies you when we choose it terrifies you when we choose to exercise our power in ways that do not serve your narrative. Because you cannot exist without us, you insist our power is yours to control. I cannot stop you from centering yourself in this story, but know that I am also a God. I will continue to live and be loved and enjoy a, an extraordinary existence without you. Goodbye, Izanagi. 
And with that, the two walked separate ways and never looked back. According to the ancient text, feeling polluted by all the rejection and negative energy, Izanagi went to the ocean and washed his body, cleansing himself from the filth of the underworld. As he washed himself, he began to weep beautiful masculine tears. And from his tears were born the sun goddess Amaterasu, who would bear him many grandchildren. They would grow up to begin the imperial bloodline of Japan and keep him company and honor him as the first father of Japan and eternal patriarch of the Shinto pantheon. In the Kojiki, the story of Izanami ends at the boulder. Izanagi plays a role as father to new gods and is an active character in many stories following this one. Izanami is never mentioned again. In any story, when a character breaks free from the role they are supposed to play and begins to embody who they actually want to be, that's when the story gets interesting. Five years ago, when I started this series, I did not know about Izanami. It was 2018, two years into the Trump presidency. I had just experienced an unwanted pregnancy that resulted in an abortion amidst constant talk of restricting our reproductive rights. It was a time when people all over the world took to the streets to participate in women's marches and used Facebook as their main platform to communicate their thoughts and opinions on how they felt about pink pussy hats. These timelines were also flooded with graphs and data counting how many women from which demographic caused this by voting for the wrong person. All I could see was a world that hated women and blamed them for everything. I felt so much anger and I was desperately looking for a way to process it. And that's when I ran into Resistance Auntie. So for those of you who don't know or maybe don't remember, Resistance Auntie is Anita Yavich, an Asian American woman who attended Trump's inauguration when he first stepped into office. During his whole speech, she stood tall in a purple parka with her hands held high in a middle finger gesture. She immediately became a viral meme and icon for many Asian women, including myself. At the time I was studying Buddhist sculptures and, and in particular was attracted to their beautiful hand gestures. Known as mudras, the hands symbolize various prayers and mantras. I began to think if there were ever a mudra that represented how I feel, how we all feel towards each other right now, it is this hand gesture. So I made the first vessel in this series uh, before it even was a series in honor of resistance auntie. At the time I called it my anger jar, but eventually I would name her Venus jar one. While making my second piece, I began thinking about the meaning behind the middle finger. Why is it that when we feel anger towards someone, we give them this gesture and yell, fuck you? The more I thought about it, the more disturbed I felt to know that as a society, we've normalized signaling gestures of sexual aggression towards each other to express our anger. And on top of that, the gesture of the middle finger used in this way suggests that it is somehow demeaning to be on the receiving end of sexual intercourse. Can the middle finger not be used to represent our demand for pleasure? It made me realize we live in a phallocentric world that is terrified of being penetrated and unable to comprehend the value or the existence of pleasure and power without the presence of a phallus. I began to use these hand gestures, not only as a symbol for my own anger, but to challenge this fear and these heteropatriarchal views of sexual intimacy and pleasure. So as the series progressed, as I started just making more of these pieces, just because it felt good to make them and I wanted to make more, um, I began uh, to research the history of clay vessels and their connection to human spirituality from the beginning of time. It is at this point that I began to study what archaeologists call the Jomon Venus, or um, ancient clay fertility idols found in archaeological sites all over Japan. While it is clear to me that these forms represent women and must have held great cultural importance, 
The gender and spiritual significance of these forms and the possibility of them originating from a matriarchal culture are still contested in many academic circles. This made me curious about the role women played in the spiritual practices of Japan. I discovered the story of shamanist queen Himiko, who is believed to be the first leader to unite the many small warring clans of ancient Japan. Early historical texts from China dating back to 297 AD describe her ascendance to the throne as such, quote, the country formerly had a man as ruler. For some 70 or 80 years after that, there were disturbances and warfare. Thereupon, the people agreed to a woman for their ruler. Her name was Himiko. She occupied herself with magic and sorcery bewitching the people. Though mature in age, she remained unmarried. She had a younger brother who assisted her in ruling the country. After she became the ruler, there were few who saw her. She had 1,000 women as attendants, but only one man. He served her food and drink and acted as a medium of communication. She resided in a palace surrounded by towers and stockades with armed guards in a state of constant vigilance. End quote. While many Chinese and Korean histories mention this queen, she is not formally recognized in Japan's imperial bloodline because not enough scholars believe that she was a real historical figure. Oops. It was from here I continued researching and, um, in, and stumbled upon the story of Izanami. I thought it was interesting that cultures all over the world have a story about a man who follows his girlfriend into the underworld trying to quote, save her, but would inevitably fail because he couldn't follow a simple set of instructions. Yet this very mediocre character is always celebrated as a hero and has this whole long saga centered around him. Why would a whole religion name a woman as their primordial mother and queen of life and death, but have no stories about her once she transforms into the queen of death, which is an essential part of the human experience. Why is it so hard to verify a woman like Himiko, who appears in official historical texts in multiple countries, including the one she's from? Why do we continue to dig up ceremonial objects of worship depicting women's bodies, but refuse to believe there may have once existed many cultures that revolve around a matriarchy. Why do we continue to pass up the fascinating stories of these incredible mythical women? So I felt a need to fill this gap in the narrative. I wanted to know what happened to Izanami after she turned around and walked away from that boulder. Izanami's world and her fully realized power remain unknown to us because the voices that are allowed to carry on these stories have never held an underworld of their own. They don't believe it exists unless they can center themselves in the story. Like the Hanya mask, these women can only be understood as villains and monsters in our current cultural narrative. So I created this body of work imagining Izanami's untold or perhaps more accurately forgotten story. Each of these vessels represents an uncelebrated realm of femininity that Izanami must discover as she journeys through the underworld. Much like the mysteries of the ancient Jomos, Jomon Venus figurines, their histories and spiritual significance have been forgotten and must be rebuilt. Each mask represents women who help her along the way to navigate her journey of self-discovery. I call them battle masks because to live and grow as a woman is to constantly navigate and survive misogyny. We have to navigate the internalized misogyny we hold for ourselves and each other with grace and dedication. And we have to survive this world that thrives and prospers off the oppression of femininity. They're inspired by the Hanya mask I love so dearly and celebrate the beauty and power of what we are often told is so monstrous and shameful. 
And lastly, um, in this exhibition, when you first enter, there is a like a full wall um, that is covered floor to ceiling in these small uh, three by three inch masks. Um, and it's I call it the spirit wall. But this wall was built in honor of the hell hags who helped Izanami chase her colonizer ex-boyfriend out of the underworld. They represent the many facets of femininity that do not get to shine in patrilineal storytelling. The infiniteness of womanhood and feminine identity. Much like how the womb holds all of human history, as women, we hold every version of ourselves that we have ever been and every version that we allow ourselves to be in the future. And so I kind of see this uh, wall as like all of the facets of womanhood. And um, my goal is to make 1200 of these little pieces. Currently I've made 600 and at the show there's about, I think it's 320 that is on display. Um, and so that kind of encompasses um, the conceptual background and the story of how I came to make this body of work that is on display at the Fry. Um, my What I'd like to do next is actually um, write a whole like written saga of what happens to Izanami as she like is discovering her underworld. Um, I think one of my, the biggest critique that I have so far of myself and this series is that when it comes time for me to, you know, talk to you all about this work, where it comes from, why I made it, it still very much um, hinges on this traditional story that is centered around a man and a woman um, and their relationship. But my goal is to create a whole world and a whole narrative that exists free from male characters and gazes and perspectives. Um, and so I built that with clay, but I haven't found the words to tell it yet. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of like something that can only form through like living through, through the experience. Um, and, yeah, it's up next. And hopefully someday I'll be back to give you a talk with that story. But at the, for now, um, what I can give you a talk is, including this talk, is stories about um, each of the individual vessels. But also I kind of had uh, a saga of kind of being able to fully or see myself more fully just in the process of making these masks. So I've kind of got like a mini story for you here on how these masks came to be about. Um, so like I said before, this is a series of 12 masks. I call them the battle, battle masks. And um, I kind of imagined them off of like people, some real, some kind of fictional. But, um, you know, being being like a fantasy nerd and like a folktale nerd that I am. Um, I was always like really excited about this idea of King Arthur and his like round table of knights. But then when I started really thinking about stories and perspectives and kind of like how they shape what, how we like see and move through society, I was thinking like, why are there so many stories of like, guys sitting at a table with his friends when really if anything in my own life what I see the most often is like women sitting at a table with her friends and like gossiping and strategizing and talking about you know like their adventures and so I was thinking like if Izanami had a round table of you know hype women and advisors and mentors and friends um, who would they be? So these masks are kind of based off of, of those people, like who those people would be. Um, but yeah, I also had my own kind of internal thought process and realization of myself while making them. So um, they're pictured in order of how they were created. And um, 
Just as society has a tendency to bury women's stories and their power, I think as women, we have a tendency to hide from our own bodies. When I created the first mask in this series, I was thinking about how we are constantly surrounded by phallic symbols in our everyday lives. Everything from skyscrapers to space spaceships to bus stop graffiti. I wanted to create a Yonic symbol that I could incorporate into my environment. I made this mask thinking it was very abstract and stylized. To me, it was symbolic, but not literal. I didn't think at all that it looked anything close to a real vulva. At the time, I was making my work out of a shared community studio space with many student and resident artists. I was surprised to see the reaction of my studio community as I built these first few pieces. Many of them loved what I was doing, but there were also many who were shocked and uncomfortable. At one point, someone tried to argue that my work could be interpreted as hate speech. Another person referred to the pieces as dreadful, hateful monsters. So this inspired me to push harder to make work that was more ionic, more anatomically correct. So I started using medical illustrations of vulvas for reference as I built the masks. But for some reason, I still found myself resisting the use of real photographic references. Many of these early pieces are created from my own imagination. I used animals and other mythological creatures to inspire some of these forms. This one here uh, was created while referencing crustaceans and different forms of um, ocean life. I continued moving back and forth between highly abstracted and more realistic. With this piece, uh, War Mask number five, I, I finally ventured into using oxblood glaze. Um, for those of you who don't know, in ceramics, oxblood is a glaze that is very valued for its ability to turn a deep blood red um, when fired in the right conditions. Normally, I love using this glaze. It's really exciting. It can range from just like a clear green color to this like deep, rich red. Um, but I resisted using it on these masks because frankly, I was afraid of my work being interpreted as period art, as if there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I'm already making work about vulvas anyways. Why wouldn't I go into that subject matter? Um, but I don't know, I was just hesitant. And, uh, but I decided to try it. And half of me was hoping that it would be kind of like a, a wimpy firing and it would just turn like a crystal green and that would be pretty too. But of course the firing went really well and it turned this deep dark red color. It was the exact result I was afraid of, but once I saw it, I, I realized that it really needed to be made and I'm so glad that I did. So it was also around this time, halfway through the series that I started using gold to highlight the glazes that pool within the vulva forms. Um, with the gold, I highlight and add value to the wetness of this body part. Through the use of gold, I celebrate what might otherwise be judged is obscene and I give it value. But still at this point, I'm building a lot from my own imagination. Um, and this piece here is inspired by a mythical Japanese character creature called the Tengu, who is believed to be half man and half bird. Um, Tengus are also kind of uh, commonly seen as these like fertility idols. Um, there are these like wild bird men who live in the woods who are master swordsmen and um, just, you know, know how to survive out in the elements. But I want, um, and the original mask has this like very long red phallic shaped nose. And I wanted to recreate this, this character, this figure, um, but reimagine it as like, what would it look like what what does it look like when a woman possesses this kind of 
you know, masculinity. And so um, this mask is kind of inspired from that. So four years into this series, um, uh, living my own personal life, I fell in love with a woman. And um, it was at that point that I was finally able to begin uh, working from like real vulvas as my muse. Um, through falling in love with her, and experiencing her beauty and her perfectness, uh, I could finally begin to confront my own internalized fears and discomfort with my body and the idea of what it means to have a vulva and, and what is really a vulva. Um, and so from here, this was like a big turning point in my work. Uh, at this point, I started making my masks a lot bigger. Before then, they were all about, you know, comparable to an actual human face size. So they're maybe about like a foot big, like tall. Um, but I decided to like at least double it. So then all the masks I made from this point were two or three feet tall. And I also began when I was showing it in uh, shows, I already started playing with this concept, but from here on out, I insisted that they were hung um, much higher than normal eye level. So um, in all the uh, shows and exhibitions I would put them in, I would have them hung at, so that the, the center point of the piece was at six foot high. Um, it was important to me that the viewer is made to look up to these masks. Um, this is a part of, a, uh, of our bodies that we're often told to hide and be ashamed of. And so I wanted the, it to be displayed in a way to give them power and agency and to have them take up space in relationship to the viewer's gaze. So um, after five years of working in this series, uh, I finally made a piece using myself as the reference. And even after five years of making this work and going up and giving talks about it and speaking about it, I found that it was still very, very hard to, um, to look at myself to build one of these masks. And it wasn't until it was finally hung in the show that I actually decided that I really liked it and, and that you know, it was beautiful. And so um, I share this story with you all uh, just because I think, um, you know, the point of me rewriting the this story about Izanami making these vessels, making these masks is uh, partly to speak about how as women we're not really allowed agency in our own transformation. Um, it's really depicted in only a few ways. We're either like maiden, mother, or crone, like happy grandma. And if there's any sort of like discomfort or pushback between any of those stages, then we're immediately deemed like a monster or like a bad person. And we're not given any grace in the messiness of, of how we come to accept ourselves, to love ourselves, to grow. And so I think it's really important um, as women, as people who have, uh, vulvas to push our own versions of our stories and our experiences, because, um, through creating this work, we also grow and, uh, and, and it helps all of us to be able to see this. Uh, it helps all of us be able to see ourselves and, yeah, so um, that's why I'm really grateful that I've been able to dedicate my time into exploring this body of work and that I get to share it with you all. Um, I'd like to now open this conversation up for any questions that you might all have. Um, I do have uh, more images of each of these vessels. Uh, many of them also have their own story of what inspired them and how they were built um, and things I realized while I was creating them that I'm happy to share with you. So um, yeah, 
if anyone has any anything, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, Hanukkah, thank you so much. I just want to first say thank you. And we have, we have a live audience over here. So um, there they are. Very, very appreciative of your, um, I think of your honesty and vulnerability and um, through the both the process and, um, and that you're continuing and also that the work is, is oh, did I, I lost it by moving it, didn't I? Let's see. Are we back? Okay. Um, so just to thank you for the sort of honesty, vulnerability, and process work that you're both, you both have a strong like subject and uh, commitment and and then you pose each of the things like what would it look like if as a as a question so, like so um, so honest about um, the exploration and asking questions for people that are not in this room if you have a question for us um, there is a Q&A um, on your webinar zoom link and you can um, either raise your hand, um, also in the participants list, and which is a little hard to see while I'm doing this at once, but we can. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. And then if you um, want to just type it into the Q&A, we'll try to read it. And then we're also going to open it up to people who are in the audience. And I think I see someone who's ready to ask some questions probably a bit of a kindred spirit coming up. So I'm going to hand it over to a first question. Hi. Am I looking here? Yeah, there you go. Um, my name is Jade. It's Hi, Jade. so amazing to meet you. Um, I have used vulvas and uteruses in my own artwork, and it's been very empowering and healing for myself having grown up in a very puritanical household um yeah your artwork is incredibly beautiful and potent and i resonate with the story of izanami and in in my own process of developing my own underworld and what it means to be on the other side of some really hard things um and you touched on this a bit, but I'm wondering in what ways your work has impacted you in a society that deems genitalia inappropriate or taboo. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, like I was saying earlier, I, I really don't know how I started making the work so like the first piece I made you know was resistance auntie and like I don't know how resistance auntie all of a sudden had these like kind of vaginal vulva flaps coming out of her you know but um I I just it just appeared and um I kind of realized like oh this this shape is really beautiful like as you know and then with the mask too like the first one I made it was just like stylized like a slit and I was just like so attracted to that form and I just wanted to keep making it over and over again and then the more I made it the more I think about like what it was representing is when I really started to feel the discomfort and then also when I first made it I didn't really think much of like how people would perceive it um you know it's a busy studio space people are making stuff all the time but then all of a sudden like it was getting a big reaction and um yeah so I guess I guess you kind of just like it's kind of like the same way that you start to slowly learn and internalize that you know genitalia like especially a woman if you have a vagina a vulva like all those things are somehow gross like there's all these little things as you're growing up that you start to like absorb and then it grows into this like really intense heavy belief 
that you don't even know that you're carrying. I think it's in, while I started making it, it was like all of those things slowly started popping up. And I think I was able to kind of start to just take some of it out and drop it and get rid of it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Yeah. Done. Go ahead. If you think you want to have a, ask a question, come on down here and ask it. Is this still on? Yes. It's okay. You're just talking to. Yeah, yeah. All right. Hello. Um, my name is uh, Conifer. I was just wondering about the. Uh, is there any intentionality behind uh, the clay you use? Does it come from a particular place? And um, uh, and also like your use of color, um, like you went over your use of um, ox blood and gold, uh, but like, is there any other meaning behind some of the color you use in your work? Yeah, that's, um, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, I, as a ceramic artist, there's kind of like a lot of different ways that you can fall in love with the craft. And for me, it is just purely like the joy of working with clay and building with clay. Um, different clay bodies have different personalities and characteristics and finishes, depending on what firing you take them through. And um, I kind of with that one, I just like, I really like to just browse. I don't really attach a lot of conceptual meaning or significance behind where the clay comes from or or what type. I mean, sometimes I, I think about like terracotta versus porcelain, like they're very different. They communicate different things. Um, but aside from that, it, I don't you know, I, it's not something I consider that much, to be honest. I kind of just see what see what happens, see what my hands feel like touching, and then where it goes from there. All right. Oh. All right, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions up here or hands raised? missing any of that. Nope. And nope. Okay. Great. There you go. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Elle. Um, and I love your work. I feel like you capture like all of these themes and like these folk tales like so beautifully. Um, but I was just wondering I saw like the lesbian flag in the background. I'm a lesbian and a feminist and a trans person also. So I was wondering how you, um, or like if you would consider touching on themes of like gender queerness or like um, like themes of like being trans in your work. Cause I see a lot of like conversation in your work like about gender and about like anatomy and like, um, like autonomy. So mm -hmm. I was just curious if you ever thought of touching on themes like that or like where you see that in your work. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a cis woman. I, I don't identify as trans. So while I, I welcome transness, like, you know, like this, the, the spectrum of being a woman certainly includes trans women. And also there are many people who aren't women who also have vaginas and know what it means and, and the weight you know, the experience of that. And so, um, the work is for them too, but at the same time, I am not, I try to be very honest and, and specific to my own experience. Cause I don't want to talk for anybody else. I really hope that we all do that. Like we speak from where we come from and who we are and, and hopefully that reaches the people who need to hear it. And so, um, yeah, that's why I wouldn't say that I'm going to make work specifically speaking about a trans experience when I haven't had one. But I also hope that my work 
um, speaks in a way that they feel included as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if you would speak about um, the artists that you think uh, your work may be in conversation with, and of course you think of Judy Chicago's dinner party, and maybe that's too obvious, and um, maybe it's not what you're thinking about at all, maybe there's ways that that's not in alignment, but maybe also Louise Bourgeois, um, Anna Mendieta, some of the feminist artists, not, not that Louise Bourgeois considers herself that maybe, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'm wondering who else your work is in conversation with. I think my work is most in conversation with these, uh, these prehistoric pots. Mm -hmm. um, I look at them the most and I research them the most. I mean, I've definitely, I've seen Judy Chicago's uh, dinner party and um, Anna Mandieta's work, um, Louis Bourgeois as well. Um, but I didn't really, I didn't start making the work thinking about them. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw the parallels like after the the work had developed a, along the way, and especially because you know people bring up their name a lot. Um, but I, I mostly just see it as like, again, like I'm not the first person to make work about povas or talk about, you know, like experiences being in a woman, a, a woman's body. Um, but I also think that there's clearly not enough of that work made yet, because whenever people do ask me who my work is in conversation with, it's like a very limited handful of names. So a long time ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah. so um, and, you know, I think a lot of people do make work about this. It's just very, very few actually get to be remembered for that work, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just I just think that they're and and also like. You know, when. In 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 very like self-conscious times, I start thinking or when I'm feeling doubt about myself, I'll be like, oh, like, are, are how, like, how long are you going to be making this like vagina art before, you know, there's like these voices in my head that are like, are you really that artist or, you know, um, but then ultimately it's like, yeah, and I am, and I'm going to do it until I don't feel like it anymore, but I still do. And I think that, um, like we all should, if we want to, because, if there was enough of it, then we wouldn't feel the need to see more, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think also though that there are some of those questions come out and this is where it's the, the particularities of, of what you're doing that have to do with um, being a woman, but then there are larger questions people have around shame and the body and roles and breaking roles. And, and, um, and I think some of the questions that those earlier feminist artists were asking had to do with um, the possibility of the abject, right? Going from being an object of desire to being one that's thought of as sort of disgusting or, and then the, and you're talking about like the internalization. So I think of those kind of misogynistic um, ideas. So th that coming to terms with those things, I feel like is part of that, that, that is an ongoing long-term um, societal set of questions, I guess, or Mm -hmm. inquiries or yeah anyway I've got a couple of students that are ready to ask some questions so I'm gonna give it over hi my name is Vio Hello. Uh, I was just wondering if like you think it's possible to like as an artist to like detach misogyny from phallic imagery and like still be able to celebrate like womanhood with a phallus without it like I guess like there's so much baggage associated with genitalia, you know, and like, I guess as an artist, when you're, when you're constructing these forms, like, I don't know, I don't really know where to go with that, but, but 
Yeah. That's <laughs> <cool>. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think I know what you're asking, and I don't. I don't know how to answer that question. I think you have to, if if you feel compelled to find out, then you just have to make it, and and see see what you see. You know, see what comes up. Um, also, like, what's the future of your like gallery space, like as an artist, like with the imagery, like uh, I don't know, like what what are your plans for like the the next use of gallery space? Uh, I, I don't know, like like what's my next body of work? Yeah. Um, well, I want to continue building on this series. Um, I guess. Like for me, I'm still, I, I set out with the goal of making 12 vessels and 12 masks. And then I realized that in 12 pieces, I couldn't, I'm not even close to like uncovering the tip of the iceberg in terms of what it means for me to understand my own experience and agency and power, you know, in my own body. Um, and also like, I I just only in the last few pieces started to explore my own queerness and my like love for women, um, which I also want to see more of. Like, I don't know. I wonder, I wonder who I would be as an artist if this, the art I make or, you know, like more queer art, sapphic art, lesbian art, like if those things existed and weren't so hard to dig up and were just like flaunted in my face like the rest of pop culture, um, like who would I be and what kind of work would I be making then, you know, like, so um, yeah, I think I wanna explore that side of me more in uh, making this work and, and, and that world that exists in me. Uh, so yes. And then also, thank you. Like, yeah. thank you so much for sharing and being vulnerable. Thank you. Yeah. I love your art <laughs> so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's right up here. Hi, um, I'm Griffin. I wanted to commend you because I think you're a really great storyteller, both in um, you kind of explaining Izanami's story and in your sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of curious as you, because it sounded like you were going to move more into writing, um, the kind of similarities you see or like lessons you're taking from working with sculpture and like visual art in that way, bringing that into writing as a storyteller? Well, um, I guess there's so many artworks and sculptures that have been made based on mythology. I think, and I've already kind of taken a mythology and at least part like re reformed the perspective. I mean, I took a lot of creative liberties with the original story and the one I wrote um, to match or to, to be like a pro is it a prologue to, um, you know, the work that I've created, like with sculpture. So I think my next, what I want to do next is just research folk tales, mythologies, stories that do center um, female characters and kind of like use that as a inspiration to expand, expand on it and make work based off that. Okay, thank you. And real quick question, is your work still in the Fry Museum right now? Yes, it's up till the 28th. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So we have a hand raised here. I'm going to pull over here. Is that right? There is a hand. Layla has a question. I, I was um I was wondering I can't remember what they were called now but you the uh, beings that helped Izanami with following after Izanagi you said that you you were making like a 
a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of little masks, right? I was wondering about like the scale of them, um, like how how like are they are they very small? And if they they're, are very small, they're about oh, like this size, so it's like three inches, three by three inches. And is yeah. it very difficult to to get a lot of detail on clay that small? Um, I would say no. Uh, but it's probably also because I've done it, like made so many that like certain details, like, um, hands, for example, uh, I it's, it's kind of muscle memory at this point. So I actually find it very relaxing. You said you, you want to make like 1200, right? Mm -hmm. And you've made like 600, right? Yes. Yeah. So you're about halfway done. <laughs> about halfway. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have, um, I wonder, do you have any like close up pictures of them? Ah, shoot. No, I don't. I, I didn't grab any for this presentation. Because I, I was very interested in the, like, it looked like there's a whole bunch of different styles and colors were on there. Yeah. So I kind of use them as like really fancy test tiles to test out surfaces. Um, before I fire these like larger pieces that are kind of more high stakes, I'll just make like 20 masks and and see which ones I like and use them as a reference. That's really cool. I, I, your entire body of work is just very, very cool to me. <laughs> and thank you. Any more questions about materials or um, or subject or process or professional stuff? Um, I have a question for you about. I thought it was interesting um, that your masks are the battle masks, and you are actually. If you think of anatomy, you're sh you're bringing the soft parts up to the front, you know, and I was interested in what. So on on the one hand, it's sort of um, a, um, a confronting of something that we hide. Mm -hmm. So that's in a way of, a way of if you're not hiding, you have, if you have nothing to hide, yes. then you have nothing right to lose. And on the other hand, you're really, it is, a, it is a soft part. It is a part that our bodies actually do hide, not just because of social norms, but also because of um, protecting, you know, protecting that. So I'm just curious about what you think about um, the, that, that kind of contradiction or that maybe it's a, um, a dialectic that works together at the same time, that there's strength in that vulnerability and that kind of thing. 